And uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, please enjoy today's presentation. Hey, thank you so much. There is no problem about the um, absence of, of uh, Vasco da Silva. We will have other opportunities to, of course. Uh, well, I'm very glad to to hold a lecture here on this Alpis interesting initiative. Uh, the topic we choose together is the state of exception as a legal concept. Well, I would like to speak not more than 40, 45 minutes so far, and, and, then, uh, and then let enough space for discussion, questions, credits, and so forth and so on. I would like to speak about four topics. The first one, the relation between law, uh, I mean the legal system, and uh, the exception. The second topic is the different forms of exception. The third one, uh, what the state of exception is and what it is not. And the fourth is the, the main topic of my, the main issue of my, of my lecture. That's to say the constitutional problem of the state of exception. Uh, this is an enormous amount of problems to be and so I will not speak, for instance, of the central topic of Roman law and exception. That is something extremely important and uh, something that gave also room for huge misunderstanding. But we do not have enough time to, to speak about Roman law and exception. So I start from the first topic, the relation between law and exception. Uh, the concept of exception is, is firmly tied with law. Uh, there are many conceptions of law, of course, positivism, normativism, uh, realism, institutionalism, decisionism, and so forth and so on. But no theoretical conception of law uh, underrates the importance of law as a legal system of norms. That's to say, at least for every theoretical conception of law, law is at least a legal system of norms. As a legal system of norms, it logically embeds the concept of exception. Why? Not only because it is trivial to say every rule implies an exception. No, it is not the case. But, but because no rule uh, is enabled to uh, deny the possibility of an exception to its rulings. Uh, the word exception uh, is not so easy to, 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 to be understood. Um, I, I'm not going to give something like a definition of, of, of the entry exception, like, like, uh, like, uh, like a law dictionary. Uh, but I would like to to uh, point your attention on, on this problem. That's to say, uh, is it possible to make a difference between the legal concept of exception and the legal concept of rule? Uh, recently, one of our prominent Italian uh, students of international law, Professor Cannizzaro, wrote uh, a small but very, very important book uh, about uh, sovereignty and state. And he stated that according to, to his idea, it is not so easy to, to separate exception and rule. 
what is the idea of Professor Canizzaro? Uh, he says that if the exception is defined and ruled by law, well, it becomes rule, even though applicable in exceptional circumstances. Well, I think that this statement is not correct. Uh, it is grounded in, in, in a lexical uh, misunderstanding because it uses the word rule in two different meanings. Uh, in the second part of the statement I cited, uh, the, rule, uh, the word rule is meant as a synonymous of legal norm, legal norm. And in this sense, of course, if I provide, if an exception is provided by a law, this provision is a legal rule, no doubt about this. But in the first part of the statement, rule is meant as a synonymous of ordinary norm, is what uh, the ancient doctrine called jus generale. But in this case, the exceptional norm, what the ancient doctrine called jus singulare, well, in this case, the exceptional norm is perfectly understandable as something completely different from the ordinary norm, exactly because it is applicable only in exceptional circumstances. Uh, that's to say that when we speak about uh, exceptional norms, we do speak about a concept of relation. If you want, it, it reminds me the concept of the inautonomous norms uh, in, in the idea of Anskels. That's to say, a norm that we can understand only in relation with another. So the exceptional norm is understandable only in relation with the ordinary norm. But it doesn't cease to be a norm, even though only exceptionally applicable. Nevertheless, in the, <clears throat> in the legal experience, but well, I speak ab about the legal experience of the Western tradition. Uh, uh, I, I do not speak about the legal experience of the Eastern tradition. In, in our legal experience, uh, the exception uh, started to be uh, an important part of the legal system, not as a norm, but as a legal institute. And that was in the field of, of the process of the judiciary practice. The exception, what is an exception in this field? An exception is <clears throat> an opposition to, to, uh, uh, to the right of the actor. Rather, uh, on the substantial plan or on the formal plan. Um, exception is a means to resist to a legal action. And this is the first, the first uh, way the exception entered in our, in our legal experience, above all in the Roman experience. It is something that the German process doesn't, doesn't know, doesn't recognize. It is something typical of, of the Roman tradition of uh, the jurisdiction. Uh, but it is easily understandable that behind the exception as an institute, as a legal institute, we do find self evidently the exception as a norm, 
because we have the exception as a norm permitting the use of the exception of as a legal institute. So we are always speaking about norms, about norm. The second, the second uh, form of manifestation of, of the exception in the legal experience is that of the interpretation of the interpretation. Do I face different limits when I do interpret an ordinary norm or an exceptional norm? In the Western tradition, the answer is yes. Yes, I cannot, in, I cannot give an uh, extensive or broad interpretation of an exceptional norm. And I cannot use the analogy before an exceptional norm. This is not a lecture about uh, legal interpretation. So I, I cannot speak about this, even though I understand, I do perfectly understand the importance of the topic. And, the, and everybody understands it after the recent uh, uh, statement decision of, of the uh, United States Supreme Court about abortion grounded in uh, uh, theoretical premises about uh, the constitution that even also in this in, in this case we do not have time to speak but interpret I, I just want to remember that traditionally we distinguish about two, uh, um, between two types of analogy, the analogia legis and the analogia iuris. Well, the analogia iuris, legis, sorry, the analogia legis is the extension of a norm, in a case not uh, uh, specifically ruled by specific norm. The analogia iuris is nothing more and nothing less than the application case of the general principles. Two types of analogy that, that from, from my point of view, do not have almost anything to see one, one with another. Hmm? Completely different. Uh, what is important is that we, uh, when we um, uh, carefully examine uh, the function of the exception in a legal system, there is always a common ground. What kind of common ground? Well, it is equity. When a legal system allows an exception, the reason is equity. I do not want to apply the ordinary or general norm, because otherwise the equity uh, necessities wouldn't be satisfied. So every time I allow the use of an exception, I do have under this use of exception the um, uh, the necessity to satisfy the equity, always. And we will find that even when the state of uh, uh, exception is at stake, there is always a problem of equity to be solved. Second, uh, second uh, topic, the different forms of exception. Well, we have essentially two forms of, of exception, a subjective one and an objective. Uh, from a subjective point of view, the legal system uh, is always interested in, uh, the, except, in the exceptional uh, characteristics of a specific subject. Uh, 
paradigmatic is the hero, paradigmatic is the genius, paradigmatic is the saint. But the genius, the hero, the saint, they are all equal before the law. But even though they're equal before the law, the legal systems sometimes provide a special treatment for the genius, for the hero, for the same. There are exceptional norms treating this kind of subjective uh, figures differently from the other ones. The typical, but the typical uh, uh, exceptional treatment of the subject is the principle, the king can do no wrong. Principle, the king can do no wrong is an, an ancient and traditional principle of English law, as everybody knows. But uh, its importance became clear during the years of the crisis of the Stuarts regime. In those years, uh, the exceptional meaning of the principle, the king can do no wrong, was absolutely clear. From one side, we had uh, thinkers that wanted to tie this principle with the absolute power of the king. The idea was the king can do no wrong because he enjoys an absolute power. On the other side, we had thinkers saying exactly the opposite. If the king has no responsibility, according to the principle, that where we have responsibility, we have power, and vice versa, when we have power, we have responsibility. The principle the king can do no wrong means that the king doesn't have an absolute power. Moreover, it doesn't have any power at all. Any power at all. Why? Because if he is not responsible for his actions, the result is he has no power to act. And so we can explain from this point the view, the struggle, the terrible struggle between the parliament and the king in the ears of the stewards. And we can understand from this point of view, even the special treatment of the monarchs in those uh, crowned democracies that still exist all over the world. But even in the Republican democracy, because all the legal system, they do provide special treatment for the chief of the state, especially from the point of view of the type of responsibility provided. So the idea that the specific subjective uh, uh, value of one person can influence the legal treatment, this idea is still living, even in democratic system. Even in democratic system, we still have the idea that the the subjective characteristics can be so exceptional that that subject with exceptional characteristic can and must be treated differently. The second way uh, of um, the second form of presence of the exception in, in our legal system is the objective objective exceptionality. In this case, uh, it is paradigmatic, the miracle, of course, 
a miracle. It's something that, can, that has to be treated exceptionally because it is something exceptional. But what is a miracle? And what is a fraud? In this case, the legal systems uh, do reason differently. Normally, what do they do? There is a miracle when it is provided by a religious belief. And there is a fraud when there is no religious belief and there is no specific, uh, uh, I should say, religious community uh, recognizing the miracle. Uh, it is really different to classify religion and beliefs that do not have anything to do with religion. I just give you one example, Scientology. Everybody knows uh, that everywhere, all over the world, we have different uh, uh, jurisprudence about Scientology because it's very difficult to, to, to understand if it is a religion or not. But even if we do not care about the miracle, uh, the problems are, are always, are always. We do, we do face other problems. Uh, every legal system, for instance, uh, treats differently the responsibility in the case of absolute necessity. What, what, is, what is called even in English with, with a French phrase, uh, the case of, of force majeure. This case of force majeure is an exceptional case and every legal system tries to uh, recognize the importance of this uh, force majeure case to uh, avoid the consequence of treating in the same way the responsibility of someone who acted in a normal case and someone who acted in a force majeure case. Even in this case, I think you can easily understand what I said before. That's to say that even here, what is common to the topic of exceptionality, to the idea of exception in law, is always the same thing. That's to say, the necessity to satisfy equity. It is not conform to equity to treat in the same way someone who acted in an ordinary case or someone who acted in a force major case. I do arrive to the third topic, that to say, state of exception and other states that are not states of exception. I just give you two, two examples. Is the state of exception something uh, similar to the state of emergency? Second, is the state of exception something similar with war? I do start from this second topic. What, what is war? I'd like to give you two definitions of war. One from the Middle Ages and one and a contemporary, a contemporary one. A definition that is given by, by an English by an English author. I do start from the Middle Ages. The work I suggest to read is Giovanni 
a Legnano, Tractatus de Bello, de Represalis et de Duello. That's to say, the treatise of war, of reprisals, and of duel. It had been written and published also in 1360. Um, the audience can find an edition with the original text, uh, the Latin text, readable one, because the first one is a manuscript, almost unreadable, and the English translation, a very good edition, uh, edited by Thomas Erskine Holland, a specialist of the theory of just war and, uh, and uh, international affairs, and James Leslie Priory. And so people cannot read Latin and find, and find the English translation. Uh, with your with your authorization, I would like to read some eight uh, lines of the English original and then the English translation, because there is a problem with the English translation, we will see. What does Giovanni D'Alegnano say about war? Bellum est contensio exhorta propter aliquid dissonum appetitui humano proposit, ad dissonantiam excludendam tendens. This is the first part, English translation. War is a contention arising by reason of something discordant offered to human desire, tending to exclude the discordancy, tending to exclude the discordancy. I go, I go forward. Dixi contensio, hec ponitur ut genus, nam sub se continet et bellicam contentionem et alias quascum. Dixi proper bonum, et est causa unde oritu quelib contens. Dixi appetitui humano ad differentiam orum. Dixi ad dissonantiam, et est causa finalis cuius libet belli. Nam quod libet bellum tendet finaliter ad tollendam displice, displicentiam que fuit belli introductori. Et sic fiunt bella propter pacem. Uh, I draw your attention on the last phrase. Et sic fiunt bella propter pacem. Let us see the English translation. I said contention. This I give as the genius. It is clear. Contention is something general. For it contains in itself both warlike contention and all other. I said by reason of something discordant, and this is the cause whence any contention arises. I said to human desire to differentiate it from a contention of boots. It is something typical of, of the human race. <laughs> war. Uh, it is not something natural. It is something we do by ourselves. I said to exclude the discordancy, and this is the final cause of any war. For any war tends finally to destroy the displeasure which introduced it. And, pay attention, so wars are made for the sake of peace. Well, According to my idea, wars are made for the sake of peace is not an, a proper translation of fiunt bella propter pacem. Wars are made for the sake of peace means that I, I who wage war, I do want peace. I wage war because I want a peace. 
well field proper tachem means that with no importance of my personal intentions, from an objective point of view, the wars are waged, uh, the wars become, to, uh, sorry, become uh, to existence for the sake of the peace. It is really different. Why it is different? Because in the traditional, uh, in the traditional Christian theory of the just war, just war is a war with a just intention. And so the English translation uh, makes Giovanni da Legnano say something that he doesn't say. He doesn't speak about intention. He only speaks about the objective uh, uh, end of the war. That's to say, peace. But it is not necessarily my intention. It is what the war at the end produces. Peace. Okay? But Giovanni D'Alegnano, the same Giovanni D'Alegnano, said, contentio, the contention, is something general, and we have the war as a specific contentio or contention. Why is war something specific? I answer, because war is a public, is a public thing, is a public contention. It's a contention between public entities. What kind of public entities? Let us see the contemporary definition of war. There are many, many, and many definitions of war. I choose the definition of Nicholas Renger, Just War and International Order, subtitled The Uncivil Condition in World Politics, an excellent book, book uh, criticizing the theory of just war in, uh, in present days. And what does Renger say? We are at page three. War is violence waged by and on behalf of communities. Communities. It is not simply violence as such. Even Giovanni da Legnano treated the specific violence between two privateers as a duel, of course. It is not war. Such communities have been and can be hugely various tribes, religious sects, revolutionary movements, empires, city republics, states, and so on. But use of the term war implies, in some respect and to some degree, a political connotation, public political. In the modern context, the main context of war, certain in Europe, has been the modern state. Well, I do agree with Renger, and I cited Renger for, for a simple reason, because he's at the same time a political theorist and a specialist of international affairs. So, uh, I, I think that he represents these two uh, kind of uh, specialization. Uh, this definition of war make, is something that we have to, to remember. Uh, because it, it is something completely different from a state of exception. Uh, we do not necessarily have a state of exception in the case of war and vice versa. Not necessarily the state of exception implies a war. And a war doesn't necessarily imply a state of exception. It sounds strange, but it is so, and we will, we will see after why. Second example I gave to you, the state of emergency. Well, the state of emergency is different from the state of exception for the simple reason that a state of emergency is uh, uh, specifically ruled by legal norms. There are specific legal norms 
uh, identifying the conditions, giving room to the state of emergency, uh, identifying the powers uh, who have competence to act in the state of emergency, identifying the rights of the citizens that are uh, guaranteed even in the state of emergency and so forth and so on. It doesn't, any, it doesn't have anything to do with the state of exception. That's the reason why I, I am, I do criticize uh, all the statements superposing state of exception and state of emergency in the recent years when we, unfortunately, unfortunately, we had to, 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 to face the emergency of the pandemic. But during the pandemic, we knew the state of emergency, not the state of exception. I cite, I quote, for instance, the position of a well-known philosopher in Italy, Giorgio Agamben. Uh, he superposes continually uh, state of exception and state of emergency, and I completely disagree. I completely disagree. But let us see. Uh, sorry, we just... Uh, let, let us see uh, the real core of this lecture, that's to say the constitutional problem of state of exception. And let's start uh, necessarily from the statement of Karl Schmitt in political uh, theology. Uh, everybody knows the statement of, of Karsch, of course. Souverän ist, wer über den Ausnahmezustand entscheidet. What does it mean? What, what is the English translation? Sovereign is he who decides, decides on the state of exception. He who decides on the state of exception. Beware, not in the state of exception. Who decided, decided on the state of exception. What does it mean? That according to Schmidt, the sovereign is not he who takes the decision, the necessary decisions during the state of exception, but he is who decides that the state of exception is arrived, that we face a state of exception. He's, he is the subject who declares the state of exception and recognizes. Well, this well-known position of Karlschmidt doesn't convince me at all. Uh, and I'll try to, to show you why uh, with three critical arguments. The first one, well, is this definition of sovereignty useful? I do not think so. Uh, if we think, that the sovereign is someone that appears only in the state, in the case of an exception, when the state of exception arrives, what do we do? We can understand sovereignty only in a specific moment and not in the ordinary case. I just put the position of of Raymond Carré de Malbert, one of the masters of French constitutional law theory. 
in this case, we understand only la souveraineté des grands jours, only the sovereignty of the great days. But we do not understand anything about the sovereignty in the normal days. And as Bryce, as James Bryce uh, wrote, if we do place the sovereignty so high, this sovereignty is, I quote, almost always in abeyance. I will never face, or, well, I hope never to face the sovereign because lacking a state of exception, I do not have any, any sovereign to, uh, to understand and to see and to see. But what is more important, what is more important is that the sovereign is who decides on the state of exception. What should we say about the subject who decides that no state of exception occurs? It is absolutely the same thing. Because if sovereignty is so firmly tied with the state of exception, the sovereign is at the same title who decides on the states on the state of exception and who decides who decides on the state of normality because who decides that there is no exception is his sovereign at the same title of the subject who decides that an exception is at stake and so we should arrive to the conclusion that the subject that we define sovereign in, uh, in the normal days, the people, the parliament, the king, as we please, well, he is the sovereign. So we do not have any need of embrace the Schmidt's definition of sovereignty. Second doubt, are we sure that a decision about the state of exception is at our disposal? Can we really decide on the state of exception? Or rather, as Karl Marx uh, already in the 19th century understood, the revolutionary moments, uh, the exceptional moments, uh, are at our disposal when we have objective conditions permitting the revolutionary war. May I decide by myself, I am the sovereign, mm -hmm. and I decide by myself, well, we are facing a state of exception taking my own decision. Is it really possible? I do not think so. Well, of course, we can, we can make the example of Caesar. Caesar crossing the Rubicon. Hmm? But what did Caesar crossing the Rubicon? Did he decide on the state of exception? Or did he rather understand the crisis of the res publica romana? the crisis of the ancient institutions of Rome, didn't he simply certify and speed up that crisis? Was his decision a real decision on the state of exception, or was it rather a certification and an acceleration of an objective process already in movement. Well, of course, I think that the second alternative is true. Third doubt. Uh, Karl Schmitt re-elaborates a foundational myth 
uh, of the Western tradition of political thought. What is this myth? This myth is the myth of the passage from the disorder to the order. We can find the myth in many ways, but the, the clearest one is in Hesiodus, the Theogony of Hesiodus, beginning of the Greek, uh, of the great Greek uh, uh, political uh, tradition. Uh, at the very beginning of the human history, what do we find? We find chaos. Chaos is not something objective eh, for Hesiodus. It, it is a subject, chaos. But it's very, it, is, uh, it is interesting to see that chaos doesn't have any adjective. Hesiodus doesn't say anything about, uh, about chaos, about chaos. Uh, eros, for instance, is the handom, handsomest. Uh, the Tartarus is foggy. Gaia, the earth, has a big breast. Chaos doesn't have any adjective. Why? Because we do not have words to describe the chaos. Because we cannot understand. And what do we need as human beings? We need to escape the chaos. We need to build an order. We need to pass from chaos to disorder, which is something different from chaos. Huh? Chaos, disorder, order. It is Zeus, of course, Jupiter, huh? Jupiter, that allows the human beings to uh, pass from the chaos to the disorder to the order. But the passage from the chaos to the order needs an intermediate, an intermediate station. And this intermediate station is disorder. To build the order, I have to disorder. That's the idea in the mind of Schmidt. The decision about the state of exception is a disordering decision. But this disordering decision is a disordering decision aiming the building, the building of an order. There is here an intention. And we will find and we can find easily here the difference between state of exception and war. I do not really need the intention of peace to say that I am facing a war. But in the case of the state of exception, there is an intention to build something new. The sovereign, according to Smith to Carl Schmidt, is someone who wants to this order to build an, an order. And also in this case, we can see that the disordering is legitimate for equity reasons. Always, even, even here, we, we can find it very easily. Uh, I am legitimate to disorder because I want to build an order. And there is an idea of uh, equity underlying all this, all this theory. But what is, what, what is more important, and then I will, I will stop, is the concept of Durchbrechung. For Karl Schmidt, for Karl Schmidt the sovereign uh, is someone who can uh, adopt acts of sovereignty. And Schmidt says, das heißt eine Durchbrechung der geltenden Rechtsordnung. That's to say, Durchbrechung is a breakthrough. And Schmidt says, that's to say, 
Eh? That's to say, act of sovereignty, that's to say, a breakthrough of uh, the, uh, of the uh, existing legal order. That's to say, so, Durchbrechung, breakthrough of the legal order and sovereignty are the same thing. This is a page of the Verfassungslehre of the Constitution of the Area. What does it mean? What is important here is not only the break, that's to say, the fist that I give to the existing legal system. What is more important is the through, the breakthrough. I do not simply break, I break through. That means that I break the existing legal order just to pass through it to arrive to another legal order, a new one, a more equitable one, a more valuable one, a good one. So, if, if it is so, I do think that the definition of sovereignty given by Schmidt in political theology doesn't convince. Why? Because when I, when I say we are facing a state of exception, what do I do? I do break. I do not know anything more. I just know I am breaking a legal or an existing legal order. But I do absolutely not know what will happen after. Will I be able to build a new legal order or not? I make a gamble. The so called sovereign of Schmidt is something making a gamble. I hope to build a new legal order, but nobody knows if I will be in the condition to build a legal order. As a matter of fact, who decides on the state of exception is simply a sovereign in potency, not a real sovereign in act, using Aristotelic categories, of course. But if things are so, what can we say? That sovereign is not who decides, he who decides on the state of exception, but he who successfully decided on and in the state of exception. And if, it's, if it is so, the whole Schmidt's definition of sovereignty doesn't have any, any, real, any real foundation, any real foundation. Well, I think that even too much, but we started, we started rather late. Maybe I spoke 40, 45 minutes. Mr. Parashu, can you confirm? And so I will stop here and I would, I, I would like to leave enough room for critics, uh, observations, uh, questions uh, for, the debate, for the debate in one word. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, dear professor. It is one of these lectures in which one would wish that time would be more because we could uh, indeed talk and, and listen to you and I guess I'm speaking for, for the whole audience here, uh, for far more than 45 minutes uh, about this topic. So thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll start the question and answer session. I do not want to be the first one to ask. So uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, are there any questions to our dear professor? Any comments maybe? Yes. Um, can I? Of course, please. Uh, I don't know how to activate video. Uh, sorry. Okay. Uh, so, uh, good morning. 
much, uh, Professor Lutani, for listening. And uh, we, we, we do not hear we do not hear very well. Mr. Parasha, do you hear? Excuse me, Miss uh, Miss S. We could we could maybe try to deactivate your microphone and activate it again because uh, actually we can't hear you very well. Because um, the, the, may, may you please write maybe may you please write your question on the chat. I guess I guess there's some some time difference between what uh, Ms. S is saying and uh, what uh, she's um, doing right now. So I guess she's gonna start writing. Otherwise, indeed, we have some issues to, to hear you properly. Sorry. Non sentiamo nulla. And Sorry, unfor unfortunately, we can't we can't uh, properly hear you, Miss S. Maybe you can't hear us too. Is it possible? <laughs> I can I can try to to to, to call Miss uh, Mrs. Popeta because I know Miss Popeta. I, I have uh, her telephone number. Hey, thank you. Andrea, can we do something on our end? What do you think? Is it is there something possible for us to to help here? I guess it's 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 a microphone issue, if I understood properly. So, uh, oh yeah, yeah, indeed, probably. Some well, sort of... well, well, well. I, I I spoke with her. Well, okay. She she will write a she will write a question, and so I I, I think that that we we can go forth now. Okay, thank you so much. And meanwhile, we're awaiting the, the question of uh, our dear Ms. Um, S here. Any other questions, meanwhile, to our dear professor or comments? Ah, there it is. It has arrived. So let me just... Wow, <laughs> that's a long one. Wow. <laughs> my the question, question concerns is... the concept. So my question concerns the concept of state of exception as you described. It's starting from Schmidt's victim. Basically, what is exactly, how can we define the state of exception? How does it manifest itself? I mean, it is something that actually exists in reality, and these are four state of things that cause it. Regarding eh? the serious subversion, it is a condition created by disordering. So for the furthermore, another question is, what are the possibilities through the tools offered by positive law to delay the appearance of the exception as much as possible? As when you're actually faced with such a condition, we witness failure of functioning of the social bodies and the and the something. Well, but I think I I understood. Uh, first problem. Well, I I think it is it is better that I I answer to these questions. With two questions, and and after we we can hear the other the other participants. Uh, I think I already I already answered before. That's to say, exception, the state of exception, is according to my idea something that has its own objectivity. It is not the fruit of a subjective decision. The subject uh, deciding that we are facing the state of exception doesn't do any more, as I said before, than certifying and uh, uh, speeding up a crisis already in course. That's my idea. That's my idea. It is maybe a materialistic one, uh, but I think it is well grounded. Uh, let us let us think, for instance, to the other examples of uh, P 
people deciding about about states of exception. I I quoted Caesar, but just think to Napoleon, Napoleon the first, or to Napoleon the third. Everyone, everyone didn't do anything more than certifying and speeding up a crisis. The first crisis of the French Revolution. Second one, the crisis of a liberal system born uh, over the basement of the French Revolution, but that didn't st still didn't have enough forces to, to grow and to be fruitful. So I think really that the state of exception is something objective. Uh, people uh, who uh, studied, studied uh, the topic of, of uh, uh, the state of exception in the ancient Greek tradition I think above all to uh, Carlo Diano. Carlo Diano is one of the most relevant experts of the Greek philosophical tradition. And Carlo Diano uh, wrote uh, uh, an exceptional, if I can say, a say about exceptions <laughs> in, in, the Greek, in the Greek thought. And according to Carlo Diano, the exception is something that cuts something that breaks it's something that arrives and we cannot do anything but register it but see but seeing what is happening we we are not masters of the exception the exception arrives and we are not its masters it it is uh, vice versa it is the exception that is the master of our lives. And so I can answer to the second, to the second question. What can we do to uh, uh, to let the exception arrive? Uh, late as later as possible huh? as later uh, as possible delay the exception what can we do to delay the exception uh, well this is a traditional theme it is the traditional theme of the katekon katekon is another greek uh, category that's to say the delay of the arrival of the Antichrist. Uh, and so we can do something to delay the exception. But if the objective conditions uh, are real, we will never have the possibility to avoid, to avoid the. Uh, at the very beginning of my lecture, I said, I will not speak about the Roman tradition. Well, I have to say something about the Roman tradition. It, it is impossible to uh, not, not, not to, to, to treat the Roman, the Roman tradition. Uh, Rome is, is a fantastic example. Uh, the Roman legal system is a, is a legal system, uh, it's a perfect legal system that understood perfectly the problem of exception and tried always to delay the exception. Just think, just, you, you have just to, 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 to think to, to the institute of the dictator. The dictator, the Roman dictator, he was not a tyrant in, 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 in the actual uh, sense of the word, or uh, a dic or a dictator in, in the modern sense, he was a he was a public functionary. He, he had uh, the the task to re-establish the order, 
and to uh, delay the exception as, as much as possible. Think to the powers of the tribunes of the plebs. Also the tribunes, they were an institution uh, having uh, the function to delay the exception. So we always have uh, institutional, legal uh, uh, solutions to delay the exception, but the Roman experience shows us that when the exception arrives, no legal institution can resist. Silla, Marius, Caesar, Pompeius, Augustus, well, at the end, the exception arrives, even though the legal system is perfectly, perfectly conceived and provides great institutions to delay the exception. I hope I have uh, an answer to, to Miss Scopi. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions to our dear professor? If that's not the case, I do have a couple of ones actually, but uh, with, uh, with an eye on the time, I'm not going to torture uh, you too much. <laughs> this, um, actually, yeah, the first would be a rather short comment. Um, of course, the, the, the theory of Schmidt was then, everybody knows, used afterwards for, for um, lay, laying the ground for, for horrible things to, to happen. Uh, and of course, affecting the, the, uh, the world history. Um, he also, if, if I uh, remember correctly, aimed in his theory at the, at, the, at the common good or at the public good. So um, it is questionable if uh, the uh, transferring of uh, his theory to uh, real life and to uh, practice uh, was indeed aiming at the, at the common or public good. But that would be just merely a comment. Um, of course, this theory was, was used in order to, to lay the ground for the for the status uh, after 1933 in, in, uh, in Germany. Um, another thing which I found most interesting, and uh, since um, I don't have many opportunities to ask uh, Italian scholars, um, um, having in mind that the king can do no wrong, I, I always wanted to ask because it's, it's uh, out of a personal curiosity. And uh, since I uh, have read about the, the life of Umberto II, um, do you think that, um, uh, well, transferring this theory maybe to, um, to real life, he was just uh, the wrong person at the wrong place at the wrong time. And uh, if there had been another historical background before him, because I think that he, paid mostly for the for the errors of his uh, father and then lost his throne um, but i always wanted to ask that and i think uh, it is a golden opportunity to ask a specialist now uh, <laughs> uh, what do you think about that do you think that uh, he was indeed the he he uh, did wrong although uh, he couldn't do no wrong based on uh, that uh, elder theory and he was the wrong person at the wrong place at the wrong time. Sorry. With the first question, I had some problems with my computer and I do not, I'm not sure I, I, I understood because I, I heard only some words. Uh, but uh, if I well understood, you asked me if uh, uh, Karl Schmitt's theory was functional to its political uh, scopes in 1933 or not? Uh, it was, no. it was merely, merely comment because Schmitt's theory led to other things. Then. That, that was just a comment, not a question. Ah, not a question. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, uh, well, of course, uh, uh, Sch Schmitt's theory has his own merits. 
and his own demerits. And uh, uh, what happened if, uh, what happened after, because we always have to remember that uh, 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 political theology uh, had uh, had been read, written in the 20s. The first edition is from the 20s. And, uh, uh, but, and Schmidt was uh, one of the critics of the Weimar Constitution, of course. Uh, well, I have to say that he was a great constitutional lawyer, but he was not innocent. This is my idea. When I read his justifications at Nuremberg, his answers in Nuremberg, when I read um, uh, Ex Captivitate Salus, the little book in which he tries to give uh, uh, I, do, I should say a good image of, of, of his own life. Well, I'm not really satisfied. I, I think it's really poor. Uh, but in any case, we can evaluate his theories uh, in, in their objectivity. As to the questions, Umberto II, uh, the, the, uh, the, failed, the failed king of it, uh, was it? Was he the wrong person in the wrong moment? Uh, I think that you can never, never separate the responsibility of a king from the responsibilities of his ancestors. Uh, they are dynasties. Uh, there is a line, there is a line of the kingship. It is not only a problem of a king, it is a problem of the kingship. And the kingship is something bore by a dynasty. And in this case, the responsibility of the Savoya dynasty were so, ter were, were so terrible that no one could face, could face these. Uh, this path to save the monarchy after the end of the war. It was really impossible. But I have to add that Umberto II was not so politically able. He was sure that above all in the southern part of Italy, monarchy was so, so well-rooted that uh, probably uh, it would prevail, it would have prevailed in the referendum. And before, he was convinced that no one would have given to the people the opportunity to vote about monarchy or republic. That was the genial idea of Palmirio Togliatti, secretary of the Communist Party. When Togliatti came back from Russia, uh, the Italian politics were paralyzed. Nobody knew how to solve the institutional question, that to say, monarchy or republic. And he had the idea, but why should we decide in the constitutional assembly? Let the people decide. And what Umberto didn't understand was that the people's sentiments were so tired with a monarchy, so, uh, so compromised with, with fascism that, uh, he, that, that monarchy couldn't prevail. Thank you very much for these very valuable insights. As I said, I always wanted to, to ask an insider this question. So thank you, thank you warmly. Dear ladies and gentlemen, are there any further questions? Anything else that you would like? to maybe comment on or also ask. It seems not to be the case. Great critics, supporters of Schmidt, sustaining mm -hmm. his definition of, of sovereignty, of course. Don't see any, any other 
volunteers. Therefore, dear professor, I'd like to thank you warmly once more for your time and for the precious lecture that you gave us today. I have to admit that I, uh, and I think that I may speak for the whole of us, that I've learned a lot today. And as I said in the very beginning, we will, of course, have you in mind and invite you again uh, in our lecture series, um, because I think these uh, parts of the law are not often spoke about, uh, spoken about, and uh, it is necessary. It is necessary to to cope with these elements also in order to get a spheric view. Uh, so once more, thank you warmly. And dear ladies and gentlemen, also a heartfelt thank you to all of you who uh, attended to today's lecture. Thank you to you. Thank you to the audience. And, uh, and please, my best wishes to Professor.